Jonah, can you say a word? A word. <laughs> a word, a word, a word. Okay. Hi, I'm Jonah Willengans, and I am the director of the Stanford Storytelling Project. Welcome to this series of tutorials that will walk you through the process of turning your research work into a compelling story for podcast. We um, are going to start by talking a little bit about the difference between a research paper and a story. And before we even do that, I just want to um, say a word about why we're even doing this in the first place. A research paper or an analytic paper exposition is terrific as an occasion for um, evaluating information. However, it's not a great vehicle for delivering understanding or learning. Um, it's actually not the best vehicle for persuading people of things. And in the sciences in particular right now, the amount of information and complex ideas has grown enormously in the last hundred years. And there's a very um, serious challenge in communicating that often to people who are not specialists, who are not in the sciences. And so we want in this series to help you begin to take your research and turn it into something that can communicate to a wide audience and transfer to them or transmit to them uh, the learning that's occurred for you. This is maybe a typical paper you do for a college course. And then a scientific paper, which is maybe something that some of you have encountered and others have not. Um, in a research paper, you'd have a thesis. You'd make your claim about something. Um, you would then build your evidence. So whether you're writing a paper about Shakespeare or whether you're writing a paper about um, uh, a biological uh, experiment that you've done. You have your claim, you have evidence, usually several paragraphs of evidence. Um, and then often at the end, but sometimes at the beginning, you'll have counters. You'll take on the counter arguments that people might make. And then you would have a recap at the end. Um, if you, for example, were arguing against the death penalty, you would say, okay, the death penalty should not be enforced at the federal or the state level. Here's the reasons why. Uh, and then you might go to statistics uh, of various kinds about its efficacy. You might go to um, uh, famous people who have been against it, who if you, know, you like those famous people, you should side with them, that kind of thing. And then you might go to the counter arguments, and then you would have a recap. In a scientific paper, a typical structure of a scientific paper would be to present your finding, then present the context for the finding, how it came about, why it's important, what occasioned needing to look for it. Then um, you would, for quite a while, describe the methods. Usually there's some sort of form of experiment or study that's been um, at, the, at the root of this. And then the results. You describe the results. Uh, and then in the discussion, in the last part of the paper, you often talk about um, limits or shortcomings, uh, concerns, um, and then future questions. That if this is proven to be true, what would you do next? What would be the next uh, experiment? So these are um, typical structures of research in scientific papers. Story, however, works um, by beginning with usually a setting, introducing you to a character, and then doing a plot. But usually what happens is you have some kind of journey where somebody makes a discovery, uh, invents something, or sometimes just realizes something. And in this structure here, what we essentially have is something that goes through time. So it has usually a problem or an issue that arises in a scene. Then you have a person or maybe a group of people or institution, something like that, who acts to try to address it. And that creates the plot. There are usually a series of events. And those events lead to usually what we would call the solution or the resolution of a 
of the plot. So if the problem happens to be um, how to cure diabetes and somebody comes up with a solution to curing diabetes, then we would tell the story of the problem, who the scientists or researchers or uh, other people who may be in a position to solve this are, what they did, the events, and then what led them to the, the breakthrough. Oftentimes, you can actually take the same information that you would present here and turn it into a story relatively easily. And for your course, um, the design is going to be such that it will not be a difficult process for you to do this. So I'm going to now just take you very quickly through an example. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with a device called the Alter-G. The Alter-G is a device uh, invented in the last um, decade or two that allows, essentially what it does is it creates a bubble around the subject, so uh, at the waist, that decreases the amount of air pressure around the lower body. And what that does is it allows uh, for rehabilitation of injuries, for example, like a knee injury, so that um, somebody can run and have normal motion, but the amount of apparent uh, weight or load on the joints is much less than it would be normally. So therefore, the rehabilitation can take place with less danger to overstressing the joint. So this is the device. It has another application in space, which is actually, instead of decreasing air pressure, it actually will increase air pressure. And this allows astronauts to experience something like uh, Earth gravity while they're on uh, a space station or on a vehicle so that they can continue to strain the muscles in the normal way so that the muscles and the bones as well don't deteriorate. So let's say you're going to do your research on this uh, Alter-G device and you're going to write a paper. The paper might look something like this. The first thing is to introduce the device and what it does, what it accomplishes. This is essentially a version of your thesis or your finding. The second thing that you're probably going to do is give the context of why this is important, which would be um, maybe some explanation of uh, uh, people who have injuries uh, or the, uh, its application in space. The next thing you're going to do is to describe how it works. So the how it works is really functioning as your evidence here. And then the next thing you probably would do, or could do, is describe who it applies to. Who are the main people affected by it? And then you might conclude with limits, and then also um, what the future holds. Other applications, other things that it might do. Um, and this would essentially address maybe counter arguments, that would be the limits and um, possibilities for the future. So this would conform um, both in some ways to the, the research paper and the scientific uh, paper. If you look at the scientific paper, we introduce context. The how it works is a version of the methods. The results is a version of who it applies to. And the discussion um, is often the place in scientific papers where you talk about limits and future questions or possibilities. If we're going to turn this research paper into a story, I'm going to give you a typical story. There are lots of different ways that you could tell the story of the Alter-G and transmit the same information. In other words, when you're done with the story, you would know all of the same things that you knew from the research paper, but it would have been delivered through the vehicle of a narrative. The vehicle of the narrative would give us something like three elements setting, character, and plot. And the story would probably might look something like this. We might start with um, the problem. We start in a time and a place. We have um, in space, astronauts are losing bone mass and losing muscle um, strength. So when they return to Earth, they're very weak and have to spend a lot of time rehabilitating. Then we would introduce a character, the scientist who starts to work on this, who is actually Robert Whelan, who worked at NASA Ames. We might also introduce some minor characters, like other people who are working on the same problem. 
and then we get the plot. And the plot would be, through time, the investigation of this problem. So we might have, okay, they tried this, then they tried this, and then finally they reach a solution. And the solution actually may also be um, in parts. They succeeded and found one thing that worked, or they found part of the solution, but it didn't work in certain situations, and then they solve that. So your plot is essentially taking us through um, arriving at it. In the process of the plot, we're going to get how it works and who it applies to. That will come through the story. Once we get to the end, we can talk about um, its adoption and where else other uses that uh, might exist for it. So what we've done is we've taken the Alter-G research and we've changed it from the uh, format of a research and scientific paper, which is excellent for evaluating, um, it's an excellent format for evaluating uh, the evidence for how it works, uh, how it can be adopted, but it's not so great for um, us to absorb and really remember. So what we've seen so far is a comparison of creating a piece for a research paper and a narrative for the Alter-G device. And the story that we're producing here might run something like this. In the 60s, when we began uh, working in space flight, we discovered that weightlessness posed a lot of problems for the physical health of the astronauts, namely that they weren't under the normal gravity and loads that their bodies experience on Earth, and so they, all of those muscles and bones in their bodies would deteriorate very quickly. So that creates um, an agenda for NASA to figure out how to um, create artificially these conditions so that when they do space flights that are longer or have a space station, astronauts can maintain their physical health. Enter Robert Whelan, one of the engineers at NASA Ames, who comes up with a way to create artificial gravity in a sense by creating a device that changes the pressure around parts of the body, giving that body full range of motion, but at the same time experiencing the conditions that it would experience on Earth. So that's the story that we get. For most of us, if I tell you that story, you're going to remember, learn, understand, and feel that this is an important device, much more through that story than reading a research paper about it. And the reason for that is something that we've known since Aristotle, but just recently in cognitive psychology and neuroscience has been shown again and again and again in studies. Something very simple, which is that our brains are actually narrative machines. They make narrative, they love narrative, they operate as narrative. So I've come up with a little acronym. The acronym I like is SLURP. So story, as a vehicle, is the best vehicle for learning, understanding, remembering, and persuading.